Hickok 45 here and you know I live in Tennessee I'm from Kentucky so I should have an American long rifle right Pennsylvania long rifle Kentucky long rifle American long rifle whatever you want to call it a rose by any other name is still a bucket killer <laughs> what I tell you it put a hole in that bucket and you can see it <laughs> Yes, this is a, uh, a long rifle, sometimes known as a Kentucky rifle, a Pennsylvania rifle. We'll talk a little bit about that, how they're, they're kind of misnamed, and, uh, but basically it's a long rifle. That part we always get right, don't we? It is long. And this was not quite as long as some. This has a 37 and a half inch barrel, and it's uh, fairly common for one to have a 44 inch barrel, something like that. And... Uh, yeah, so they're an interesting piece of uh, American history. They really are. They're kind of uniquely American in so many ways. Now, their ancestry goes back to Germany, and England, and other places, but uh, definitely a piece of Americana, uh, whether it's a reproduction, uh, it's uh, an original, whatever that means sometimes with these, you know, because they were made for uh, centuries <laughs> and uh, still being made, handmade by... Uh, by craftsmen, artists, you know, as we speak, as this one was. So uh, let me show you. How's this? Is it a, a purdy thing? Now it's iron mounted, meaning all the, the metal work is iron. Ew, isn't that a genius uh, perception on my part? Instead of brass. I, uh, I bought this at Friendship at the National Muzzleloading Shoot a few weeks ago. Felt like I was remiss, that I was uh, being very, very negligent in not owning a Kentucky rifle or a long rifle like what is wrong with me the most American rifle firearm maybe that a person can own really uh, that's that's almost indisputable uh, because these things came to this country or they didn't really come to this country the mostly the the German gunsmiths you know settled in Pennsylvania came into Philadelphia and settled southwest of there in that area, Lancaster County and others, and they were uh, familiar with rifling, especially from rifles like the, the Jaeger, uh, and they were shorter and heavier and bigger bore in a lot of ways, but they were rifled, and they were, you know, had been used in hunting Germany and I guess Central Europe for uh, a pretty good while. Even then, even in the early 1700s, those had been around, I think since the, the late 1600s at least. And so they were familiar with rifling and how to do it. And so they sort of combined ideas of that with like some of the, the long barreled English uh, shotguns or Fowlers. And they, they came up with a long rifle, a long barreled firearm, uh, an American rifle that is actually rifled and uh, long sight radius and all that kind of thing. And this is uh, an example of one. This, this is uh, an example. This is made by a fellow that uh, doesn't make a lot of them. This is like the two, two of, of uh, 2022. I don't know if he made three or not. Maybe he's working on one now. I'll have a three for 22, but that's what that means. And uh, so I guess two or three a year. And uh, his name is Jeff uh, Schluter. There's his initials, you know, JS. Uh, lives, lives in Kentucky. How's that for appropriate? And I met him and talked to him and... Uh, you know, I went to Friendship. I was kind of researching these things. I didn't think I'd buy one. Uh, and I don't know, I just couldn't, I couldn't pass it up because you can pay a lot of money for a reproduction. Just one that, you know, Petersoli, uh, Traditions, or whatever. A lot of companies make really Italian companies and others, I guess, make some pretty nice, you know, uh, versions of this. But, you know, he, this is handmade. You know, I mean, the lock, you buy it and buy the barrel, then you do all the fitting and everything, but a lot of shaping and the wood and just a lot of work. He has about 100 hours in this, he said. And that's kind of typical, I guess, of the people that make these. And they've been manufactured and made in little shops uh, around the country, mostly in, you know, like in Pennsylvania, Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina, you know, since the early 1700s and not made exactly the same way because back then way back then they even made the barrels and the lock sometimes you're in that shop and there are people who can do that to this day but but most builders and makers 
uh, don't make their own barrels or locks. Most most don't. You can get really nice. This is a Siler lock. Uh, it's a Getz barrel. Who I think is out of business now. But uh, so you know you don't have to reinvent the wheel necessarily. But we're going to shoot it and talk a little bit about it, and I'll try not to belabor the point. I don't know enough to belabor it too much. And I want to thank BudsGunShop.com for their support of the channel. Who knows? They might have one of these up there in trade. <laughs> you never know. Uh, and we might uh, get one to review. <laughs> but we appreciate their help. And Federal Premium, I don't know that they make lead balls yet like this, but uh, we sure appreciate their support in almost every, every, uh, every time we come out here. Right? And then the Sonoran Desert Institute. Now, you know, I'd have to do some research. I don't know if they uh, have any courses in uh, working on these kinds of firearms or not, but uh, you can get on the road to becoming a gunsmith. And think about being a gunsmith, uh, once you acquire those skills of like shaping metal and how to use a sledgehammer and a Dremel, like what I do, that's my level of gunsmithing. But you learn how to do a, a certain number of things, then it, it applies to a lot of different types of firearms and wood on firearms, doesn't it? So anyway, we appreciate SDI.edu, the Sonoran Desert Institute, for their support. And before that barrel gets too uh, uh, set up, <laughs> let me uh, load it again. Now, I did bring it out on a Sunday video, and we did it. No, we didn't do a short with it, but we uh, had it out on Sunday one day and took a few shots and uh, talked a little bit about it. So I got this charger up in Ohio this weekend, or uh, yeah, pan charger. So first thing you have to do though, is get the powder back over here, is load the barrel. I'm just shooting about 70 grains. I don't, uh, you know, you, you can load up to 90 or 100 or whatever. This is 54 caliber, but uh, just for the ranges I'm shooting, I'm not trying to drop a grizzly bear today. And uh, the fellow who made this was telling me he does a lot of deer hunting with it and 44 caliber and these guns. He said, I think he said he shoots 65 grains and uh, he's he's never had one not to go all the way through the deer, you know. So uh, you can you can overdo it, but then again, for some uh, applications, you might need more more power, right? And that's the nice thing about uh, muzzle loaders in general. You're your own hand loader to some extent, aren't you? Well, I move stuff around here. I gotta find my short starter. There it is, over there. I've had that thing since '74, I guess. I've been starting a every round ball, just about I've ever started was with this ball starter. Wow, so sentimental, isn't it? And I've never seen another one exactly like it. Big old hefty thing. I don't know if Charlie Hafter may have made that. I think I bought that at his shop. I don't know. And I guess he used to make things like that. I don't, don't know. But anyway, this is pretty cool. Long rifle. Yeah, uh, like I say, this one's not as long as many of them, but it's uh, it's pretty long. And uh, it's a little heavy because it's, I mean, it's not heavy, unduly heavy, uh, but it's not a swamp barrel. When the, a lot of them, the really long ones, they swamp the barrel, which means it's normal thickness up here, but then it gets thinner out through the middle and then larger again out towards the muzzle is to get some of the weight out of it. And uh, it's interesting. If you've never picked one up, you ever get a chance, one of the really long, long rifles. That, I mean, they look like they're a mile long. They look like it'd be the most awkward thing to shoulder and try to shoot that you could imagine. And, uh, but when you pick it up and shoulder it, they're really not, they're not at all. They're, they're, they're no, no heavier than this or, or maybe even lighter, some of them. Uh, they're really an interesting uh, design, no doubt about it. Put a little, let's see now, let's put a little powder in the primer. Let's see, I, I didn't punch out the touch hole. Yeah, some people do that every time they shoot, and it's not a bad idea. We'll see if we can get by with, without doing it here. Uh, let's just shoot the gong before it gets too late. You want to? Try to. Now, I'm, I, I may not be able to uh, hit what I want to hit today. I don't know. I have been working with it a little bit, shooting it here and there and getting better. You know, I have a really negative history with flintlocks because of that Petersoli uh, 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 the brown bass. Uh, I can't hit, I can't hit that pumpkin with it. Uh, but uh, I have, I've been shooting this a little bit today, uh, this afternoon. Because you know, you might as well shoot it. You got the same cleaning whether you shoot it 20 times or three, three times. And I have hit the gong, the ram, and a buffalo over there, three for three. So I feel real good about the sights and everything, and I'm getting better with it. 
I, I may miss all of them, you know, since you're here, you know how that goes, but you know, you know, I'm telling you the truth. I did hit those and I feel real good about my progress at least. Uh, Cause you do tend to flinch <laughs> with a flint lock. That's why they're called flinch locks. Uh, but I, I'm getting better at dealing with that, I think. And uh, whatever I do in the video, so I'll start with the gong, see if I can hit it again. I noticed on that first one, I went over there to paint. I had hit it fairly high, but I'm not going to change my <laughs> sight picture too much. You know, I read, yeah, I got everything cocked correctly. Wow. Can't see it very well. All right, got him somewhere, didn't I? <laughs> All right. That is that is cool, because there even with a good lock there is a delay, and uh, I'm getting better at dealing with it, uh, if I do say so myself, and that is encouraging, because I had kind of written off flint locks, <laughs> and maybe that's just not my cup of tea. Uh, I'm just not cut out to shoot these, uh, and I just want to be able to shoot it well enough to enjoy it. I'm not going to compete with it. I, I, you know, I don't really hunt, so I'm not, I'm not worried about being a hit something at 200 yards or anything like that. Although it's a rifled barrel, and that's a, you know, obviously a point to make. The, uh, the smooth, you know, the smooth, I was kind of vague about this myself, uh, and maybe some of you are. I was, uh, you know, I've studied history of firearms you know, for a long time, odds and ends, whatever fire I'm interested in. And, and I, it always, uh, I was a little confused at times, okay. They're using smooth bores. Uh, it seems like all the way back, and and uh, all the military are using smooth bores and soldiers, and but then you hear about the Kentucky rifles and how accurate they were, and and, and others maybe I would read about here and there. And I said, okay, what? Why are? Why? Why? They, they seem during the same period. I, I, it didn't make sense. Why aren't, why aren't the military using, you know, rifles, you know, and things like that? It really is quite simple. The uh, the answer is quite simple. The smooth bores are easier to load, and you can load them faster and get more shots off. And in the the military, the way they used to fight, you know, line up and shoot each other in mass, you know, Civil War stuff, Napoleonic, uh, you know, accuracy wasn't that critical you know, being able to pick off something. You just need to throw a lot of lead down range, right? And uh, you're gonna hit something, shoot in amongst them, as they say, right? And uh, and then it, it just, you couldn't get as many shots off uh, with rifling because you see from what I'm doing, it you gotta, of course, you can put powder in. And even if you have a cartridge, a paper cartridge to uh, to get the powder in quickly and have the ball available, you, you got a tighter fit because it has to be driven down in there uh, and squeeze down in there because of the rifling. So you can, uh, you can patch them lots of different ways. Uh, I use these pre-cut patches, but see it's tight and that's what makes it accurate. All right, now I use a range rod to load. Uh, it's a lot easier and get more force on it. You drive it down in there when I'm at the range, of course. Now, if you're out hunting or something or trekking, you're a reenactor, you use the, the barrel rod. So it's not like a, a like a Civil War uh, rifle with a mini ball or, uh, or the smooth bore, just get a ball down in there. It's just easier. You don't have rifling, it doesn't clog up and get dirty as quickly. So that was the, that's kind of the thing. But rifling has been around a long time, a long time. All right, where's my primer? Where, 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 where's my cap? Oh, I don't need one, do I? <laughs> Ain't used to not needing that cap. A little powder in the pan. This is number four or 4F. All right. I'm feeling pretty good. What else should we shoot? How about let's put one on this pumpkin. You want to? All right. Boom. <laughs> yeah, it is so funny. I literally, and some of y'all that have seen the Brown Best uh, videos, I could not, I couldn't do that. Hit that pumpkin that close <laughs> right in the middle like that. <laughs> I guarantee you. I, there's a video where I'm shooting a big pot at a big pot right there where that one is. I think the pot was about this high, wasn't it? And I missed it. I literally did with that uh, brown vest. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Now, this one, you can't leave the cap on, right? Yeah, so we violate all those laws. Uh, so, a nice, nice gun. This says a one in, for those interested, it has a one in 66 twist, which is a slow twist more more 
suited for round ball, okay? If you, a lot of the, uh, well, some of the muzzle loaders, especially Hawking rifles, they have like a, what, a one in 48 twist or something, kind of a mid-range twist. So it's pretty good for round ball, past round balls like I'm shooting here, or a heavy conical, you know, ball, heavier, heavier leads. You need a faster twist for, for that, you know, so it accommodates both. But people just shoot round balls in a Kentucky rifle. They're not, generally, mostly. Uh, and uh, that and uh, the other specs of it, uh, like I said, solar lock. And uh, believe it or not, that is period correct. Uh, eight, early 1800s. This is a early 1800s uh, rifle, okay, patterned after. They did have these elevator sights at that time, on some of them. And uh, and the way he got that look was he said he put some cold bluing on it and uh, some oil and then uh, some kind of emery board or whatever and he just worked it down. And it, it's a really nice looking finish for just a iron you know, mounted gun. I really like that. So no patch box, nothing, nothing real fancy or anything, but just a nice rifle. Okay. And seems to shoot right on. I haven't had to mess with sights uh, at all and you can't do too much with them. Anyway, it, it, it's an interesting uh, area. Glad I finally got a, and again, it's not really a Kentucky rifle. Those uh, German gunsmiths, I think some of them were from, uh, there were some were Swiss and maybe even Austria, I don't know, but they settled Pennsylvania. And boy, that's where they're from. If, if you want to call this a, a rifle by a state name, like Kentucky rifle, it's really a Pennsylvania rifle. Pennsylvania is uh, way more appropriate than Kentucky, okay, because that's kind of where it all started. And then those gunsmiths, they spread out, they had apprentices, and these guns became very popular in the, uh, like, what, early uh, 1700s and on up, and, and uh, there were a lot of them being built, and a lot of new shops and gunsmiths and apprentices, and, and they were working, they were spread out down through the, what was it, the Great Wagon Trail, you know, down into, uh, Virginia, through Virginia, the Shenandoah Valley, down into Tennessee, North Carolina, uh, hotbeds for the manufacturing of the, and when I say manufacturing, it's like a couple of guys in a shop, that kind of deal. But a lot of them, a lot of famous names, you know, uh, I, I can't even think of the names now, but there's several and you'll see their, their guns. Uh, I think the earliest shop, Martin, uh, was it Mayan or something like that? They had a, a shop and like uh, documented in 1719 that was making these rifles and might have even been the person who made the first ones. Uh, I forget how that last name is said exactly, but just, just uh, is it Jacob Decker? There's several names like that are synonymous with the early ones and there's some really, really nice, nice rifles made. And they're made just like this pretty much. Same thing, some of them are longer, some are shorter, some are big bore, some are smaller bore and I did put powder in right you saw me do it so I'm gonna make sure yep just like to double check myself and get to talking so we'll start over I'm shooting a load where you know even if I double charged it wouldn't be uh, that critical this is a very comfortable load but, uh, I usually do pretty well with this when I'm yakking at you all and y'all are looking over my shoulder but I tell you what uh, muzzle loading <laughs> When you're doing it with a, a friend or at the range and you're chatting, that's when you end up not charging, you end up dry balling. <laughs> that's putting a ball in without any powder under it, then you have problems, right? So you gotta check yourself. Uh, yeah, try, if you do this, you shoot muzzle loaders, try doing it with a camera and uh, talking <laughs> about it. You really have to up your uh, concentration game a little bit, which is hard for me. But these were these are neat and uh, like I say, uniquely American. Uh, really are and popular, popular. They were so accurate, you could actually hit something up to you know a couple, maybe even 300 yards with one of these. Whereas with a smooth bore, like a brown bass or any of the the smooth bores that militaries were shooting and anybody was shooting, your your accuracy, man, after about 70, 80 yards, is dropping way down. You might hit something at 100, but as far as like a, a man-sized target or a deer-sized target out there, like uh, I don't know where the buffalo is or the or the gong. It is really hit or miss for sure. Uh, no pun intended with a smooth bore, but with this, with a little practice, and if you're on target, you should hit it every time. Okay, with me, it's just handling that flinch and everything. 
but uh, so you get a lot more accuracy and of course they played a major role uh, several times in lots of wars in the Revolutionary War as you know uh, very instrumental several battles of uh, Kings Mountain Saratoga different places it wasn't like all the Continental Army was carrying uh, flintlock uh, well they're carrying flintlocks but they weren't carrying Kentucky rifles or long rifles you know not to imply that was the case but they played a major role all right let me see I guess I put my ears on it, the thing about these they don't really hurt your ears but ought to be protected anyway well let me go ahead and try the uh, buffalo or ram which one I can see better uh, probably I won't be able to tell where I miss high or low but uh, I'll watch the video maybe if I can stand to watch myself all right <laughs> I'll tell you now I know for you all that shoot a lot you shoot a lot of flintlocks that that's nothing to get excited about hit, hitting something that big at whatever that is 70 yards or something for me it is a big deal uh, because i have struggled so much in my flintlock life and uh and it's just it's just cool i think i talked about that a lot on that sunday morning uh that i brought this out that i was just so pleased to, to learn that a flintlock can actually be shootable and i, I could actually enjoy it and uh and it, it's curly maple most of them were uh most of them were curly maple it's a it's a great wood to work with for this kind of thing and you know you got to do a lot of carving to, to be a, a an artist craftsman who makes these you have, think about all the skills you have to have and this one doesn't uh, illustrate some of the others but you have to uh sometimes you'd be a silversmith you know but you'd be able to work in iron uh, blacksmith and then do the the tedious work and the final finish work with iron or brass maybe silver and then the woodwork and some of them have a lot of uh, intricate carving uh, many of them do uh, a really cool patch box uh, you know, with brass and uh, in different fittings and, and decorations along along the, the wood so and then of course steel and getting the barrel in there correctly and aligned I mean, think about the mistakes you can make. Those of you who are like me, you really you know, can't make something like this probably. Uh, think about what you could do. You could have that barrel in there to where it's catty corner. <laughs> it's aimed the wrong way. You know, the wood's going this way. The barrel's a little bit off. And yeah, I mean, there's so many ways you could mess this thing up. So you really have to have a lot of different skills. And that's why it's so important to have an apprentice or to be an apprentice and work with someone who knows what they're doing. And uh, that was just the, the way they, they, they still do it, still do it, uh, have apprentice uh, quite often. You know, I would, if I was going to be building these, I'd want to be working with someone who knows what they're doing, learn it right there in the shop from somebody. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know what else I can, I will, uh, we'll be doing some other videos with these, uh, might end up with another type even, uh, and, uh, so I'm not going to try to throw everything I know because I don't know all that much. But the main thing is that uh, there's such a piece of uh, Americana and that they're, they're unique in, in so many ways uh, to the American experience. Uh, whether it's Davy Crockett or uh, Daniel Boone, uh, Simon Kenton, you know, it's just we're just carried all through the, the frontier and uh, high demand. Uh, and and it's hard for us to imagine, but like when those German gunsmiths settled in Philadelphia area, just southwest of there, and then they began to spread out, they were kind of on the frontier, you know, in like 1710, whenever that was, 1720, that was the frontier more or less, and then moving into Virginia and down into the Carolinas and uh, Tennessee, you know, Kentucky. That, that was frontier more or less right and uh of course lots of danger and so you wanted a good rifle uh you know, that was reliable and it was maybe your prized possession so that's one reason they got to where they would decorate them more and more uh, as they became more popular and they want a really nice patch box maybe maybe some silver inlay brass inlay and different things on it because it's kind of like your car you're know, having some cool wheels on it or something 
All right, let's uh, load him up and shoot him again. Like I said, I won't get a lot of shots in. We set up all the normal things just so I would have an option here. Shoot whatever strikes my fancy. I keep looking for primers. Oops, probably a little too much there. I've learned that, that uh, it's not one of those cases where uh, if a little is good, a lot's better. Make sure that's tight. You can get too much covering up the touch hole. Yeah, I think that's probably better. All right. Yeah, what do we want to shoot? There's something we've not shot. We ought to put one on this. Uh, let's shoot that bucket again. I kind of want to do that. <laughs> oh, yeah, I like to shoot metal no matter what I'm shooting. <laughs> we'll just shoot another time or two. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Silence for Central. Uh, great place to buy a suppressor. I don't think they make them for this, but uh, they'll walk you through it and uh, help you uh, get it ordered and uh, ship it to your door when it is approved. So, uh, again, thanks to, to SilencerCentral.com. And you notice also, I've got some cool things out here. This is not just for decoration. Uh, you know, when you're carrying something like this in the frontier, I might run a, well, maybe I'll have to run a patch. But if you're carrying a single shot rifle like this in the frontier, think about it, back in the early 1700s, mid 1700s, any time in the 1700s and even in the early 1800s, because uh, I mean, this there's a thing, this was like the state of the art. This, I mean, this, this actual rifle, the, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, American long rifle. Uh, for like a hundred years, it was, you know, what the, the desired firearm, of course, flintlock. And uh, until then, some of them were came out came out in cap lock, you know, later percussion cap. And I uh, like what 18. I think the technology for percussion caps was actually in the early 1800s, but you didn't see it as much, and a lot of people didn't even want them, especially mountain men quite often are people that were going to be out in the middle of nowhere uh, they just wanted to stick with their flint up until like 1830s even when they could have had percussion but uh still you had one shot and dangerous dangerous territory of course and so you got a shot and so it made things like this so most of them would carry either an axe like this of some sort i bought this one in guess when 894 august 94 and uh the davy crockett days down in southern tennessee sure did and uh or a big knife or both okay because uh close up work these these firearms were not even though they were used in the revolutionary war the french and indian war and other other war of 1812 different places uh you know they're not fixed for a bayonet and they're not that durable you can't go whacking people across the head with them they're a little bit more fragile I'm talking, I'll load it again. They're, they're a little bit more fragile. In fact, if you take the barrel off, which is not easy, then uh, this wood is, is very fragile. So they're, it's just, they're not designed for that, put it that way. Uh, so you, you need to be able to have a, <laughs> a club or something if you're going to be going hand-to-hand -hand once you ran out of ammo or your one shot, whatever the situation might be. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, there was something that came to mind about the Kentucky. Yeah, they weren't really called Kentucky uh, Long Rifle until I, I read it was like about 1820 or something. So they've been around like 100 years. So uh, if, you, if you're thinking, what's wrong with Hickok? That's a Kentucky rifle, doesn't he know? Well, one of the first things you learn when you start researching and studying this, one of the very first things you'll run across is how that is a misnomer, okay? Nothing wrong with it because they were used in Kentucky a lot and, and there were some built in kentucky this one was built in kentucky but uh there's some really good builders up there today even but of these but uh mike miller and others but uh there was a song i think it was after the war of 1812 the, called the hunters of kentucky or something like that and you know how the world goes because of that song uh they got to calling them the kentucky rifle okay and uh, but they were really the pennsylvania rifle or just the, the long rifle made a lot of good ones made in virginia and north carolina uh cool gun i would encourage you if you have interest in these at all to study the history and do a little research and i think you'll find it interesting and as i always say uh 
you know, the, the muzzle loading world is a bit of a smaller niche. There's no doubt about it. Uh, there's not as many of you watching right now and listening to my brilliance as we'll be listening to whatever I'm saying about the latest polymer pistol. That, that's just a fact, but that's okay. But uh, really a lot of devoted aficionados of these things. And the, again, you get into the history. Many of you do like the history of firearms, even if you don't know a lot yet. And I don't know <laughs> a lot. But, uh, you know, I, I encourage you to, to pick up a book or look at the internet. There's a lot of information on them, and it's interesting stuff. It really is. And especially if you're an American. Read, read some more about Daniel Boone, Simon Kenton, and uh, Jim Bridger, and all, all those folks. And, uh, you know, because there's so many myths about them, just like there are about Hickok or White Earp or anybody. You find out the real story, and it's, it's pretty interesting. Well, let's see. Did I... Did I hit that buffalo? I didn't know. I must have scared it down. Well, let's ring Mr. Gong again. I just like the sound of it if I can hit him. <laughs> All right. Oh, that's nice. That is nice. I don't want to overdo it. Uh, oh, and of course, I'm shooting real black powder, as you saw. And, uh, that's just what I do. I shoot real black powder, so I have a real mess to clean up. And, uh, you know, I just do it. I get my, my battle stall going, and uh, I, I get her clean and, and protected. But uh, there's a lot of things I could talk about, make this about a 45-minute video, because uh, I know a little bit more, but I don't want to get too, too deeply into it. When we do a chapter two, or maybe something with another one, I'll... I'll talk about some other things and you all feel free to share because uh, some of you who've been shooting uh, American long rifles, I typically get to where I just call it an American long rifle or just a long rifle. Either is okay uh, or a Pennsylvania rifle or a Kentucky rifle. It really doesn't matter. Uh, they're, they're long rifles and they're definitely American long rifles. Uh, and there's a, a lot of interesting history about where they were used and, uh, you know, it, in the Revolutionary War. And, of course, the, the contrast, and you probably already know some of that if you've watched The Patriot. You know, some of that is uh, actually, uh, I think, pretty historically accurate and everything. Uh, things that, that went on and, and the role that the uh, rifled rifle, you know, real rifle, you know, played. But, and, and I have had a mental block, uh, you kind of live our shooting life with us, with John and, and, and me. Uh, I, you've seen me kind of evolve from a hater of, of a flintlock to some extent, a uh, totally incompetent flintlock shooter, to someone now who, who kind of appreciates it, you know, having a firearm with a, little, a better lock and, you know, and practicing a little bit. Now, I'm not practicing much right now, as, as, uh, as lame as it might seem, I, again, am very pleased that I can hit a buffalo, you know, or a ram over there, even the gong. I'm very pleased that I can bear down on that thing and hit it and not let that flinch or that delay of the, of the, the flint, uh, you know, pull me off sight. And I'm getting better and I plan to get even better at that. Because you know what happens, you, you, you see it, uh, maybe do a basic video, but I shouldn't have to, I guess, really. But, you know, that powder in the pan has to be the, the, the flint hits that frizzen throws a spark down into the pan and lights the powder that I put in the pan. That goes through the touch hole there and lights the powder, ignites it, you know, in the breech and sends the ball out the barrel, all right? So all that has to happen, all right? It's not like firing AR-15, <laughs> it's a little bit different. So anyway, the American Long Rifle, I'm glad to have one and, uh, and be able to shoot it and bring it to you and come out and just, I've brought it out and enjoyed it three or four times. I haven't shot it a lot of, rounds through it in any one of those maybe but i have thoroughly enjoyed it and uh, i plan to shoot this one a, a great deal i really do and i'll put a notch in the stock for every grizzly bear that i take out with it how's that so that's enough for today and uh you know you folks that are experienced with these uh yeah you know share what you shoot what you have what what you like about it or you know, what you do with you hunt with it uh, you compete there are a lot of people i mean a lot of people it's in my research and 
going around gun shows and things, friendship, who, who, who like to do the buckskinning thing, you know, reenacting and go camp and trekking and everything and dress up in the old like 1700 style uh, dress or 1800s and, uh, you know, and just live like a mountain man. And that's the only thing I, I, I might add. Uh, as we moved westward, like into the 1800s and 18 whatever, 30s, 20s, 30s, then we went to a shorter rifle, typically going out west in the plains and into the Rockies. That's where the Hawkins style rifles became so popular. They're a little shorter, a little handier, a little heavier uh, barrel and, and bigger caliber for the plains and for the mountains, the Rocky Mountains. And, uh, and you could carry them on horseback a little bit easier. They weren't as long. And so, so that evolved into rifles more like the Hawken brothers uh, built, okay? But, you know, these kind of came first. You know, you had the, the Jaeger style, you know, from Germany and then uh, into the long rifle. And then later in the 19th century, it would be the early 1800s. Uh, then we, we get into shorter barrels and again, handier rifles to carry into the mountains. So uh, anyway, fascinating area and fun to shoot. I'll shut up now. Life is good. Oh yeah, that's better. This is a great gun for defense. Oh hey, didn't see you guys there. Uh, while I've got you here, I want to remind you of our friends over at Talon Grips and Ballastall. Talon Grips makes uh, grips, can you believe it? Uh, for all different types of firearms, you can get rough texture or more of a rubberized texture. Uh, just sticks right on there, you know, really affordable, really cool option to in, improve the grip for your handguns um, or, or rifles. Uh, so please check them out at TalonGunGrips.com. You'll be glad you did. And also Ballastol. Uh, Dad has been using Ballastol for many years. It's a cleaner and a lubricant, and it's non-toxic. Uh, it works really great, and we're happy to have them on board since it's been a part of our shooting endeavor for a very long time. So go to Ballastol.com talongungrips.com and also while you're out there i'm juggling all these things here also uh while you're on the internet please do check out our other social media like hickok 45 on facebook there's also hickok 45 on twitter the real hickok 45 on instagram there's a john underscore hickok 45 on instagram where i do some things there's hickok 45.com uh you can find us also on gun streamer so check out all that stuff and then watch more videos